the way I read the FDA guidelines in the time of COVID-19, it's a very hopeful document. The FDA is willing to be flexible to help subjects and patients stay safe, but continue in clinical trials as best as possible. When I read the FDA's guidelines for clinical trials during this time of COVID-19, I was really struck by number one, patient safety, um, as always, and this still remains, two, communication, and three, really, um, I was impressed to see that they recognize that modifications and or deviations to protocol may need to occur. And they may need to occur faster than the normal guidelines would allow. What the FDA guidance means for patients is that we may have to be patient and wait to enter clinical trials. There may be a delay in recruitment and delay in entry. Um, that doesn't mean that the clinical trials will completely stop. And I think what it means for people who are in clinical trials is there could be innovative ways for the data to be collected. And the FDA really is concerned with keeping people safe. So if patients are on an experimental drug that they desperately need to keep them healthy, there'll be an argument for staying on it. And if patients have a condition, which is a really risky condition, that could be helped by an experimental drug, there may be good arguments for continuing uh, the investigational um, procedure, even with COVID-19 around. Really comes down to, number one, talking to your treating physician. Um, number two is, you know, the, the institutions, whether it's the hospital or the medical center or the individual you know, treating groups, to basically come up with alternative plans of how to contact patients and how to interact with patients via you know, sort of novel approaches, if you will. Um, you know, I mean, right now, telemedicine, while we've all talked about it for many years, has been sort of a, an area that really hadn't exploded. And, you know, in the last two weeks, I think this has been the impetus to allow that to happen. I mean, we're certainly doing um, a lot of our visits now online, you know, just as you and I are talking right now. So moving to online or virtual consenting as well is another um, way to enroll in clinical trials. So, um, you know, while it's great to be face to face and in person, I think, you know, right now we're going to see a paradigm shift where that may not necessarily be the case, at least in the short term. But I think even in the long term, it actually opens up the possibility that you could be somewhere else and being enrolled on a clinical trial. And it's almost as if this is going to become the experiment to show that it's probably safe, at least to some degree, to be remote and be cared for, you know, in a safe fashion. This is really tricky times, and I, I think that we need to continue to rely on each other, count on each other um, for emotional support and for brainstorming and, and collaboration, um, but we need to communicate with our doctors, and if we're in a clinical trial, we need to communicate with the clinical trial coordinators. Yes, are they busy? Of course they're busy, um, but we need to know what changes to expect, um, and we need to be very clear on our end um, what works for us and what does not work for us regarding our safety during COVID-19. Most everyone has a primary contact as a research coordinator, and that's the first person you should contact. But on your consent form, there's always a contact uh, number or information for the principal investigator. If you're not able to reach a, a research coordinator, you should go right ahead and call the principal investigator and ask any question that you need to ask. It's important, and this is why they're doing what they do. My advice to patients 
is that, um, you know, if there's a concern, if you've got a new cough, a new fever, a sore throat, you've had contact with somebody that is known to have coronavirus, um, or you were in an area where there was a known exposure to coronavirus, um, you know, contact your treating physician, whether it's your primary care physician, your medical oncologist, whoever, you know, is your, is your physician that you're, you know, able to easily access and have a discussion with them or one of their um, staff about your exposure and what the next steps are. Obviously, if you're, if you're ill, um, you need to seek medical attention. If you've got any one of those, you know, symptoms and high fevers, new cough, um, um, the sore throat, et cetera, all sort of in combination, you, you need to you know, think about seeking medical attention. For me, it's been a long time that we've been working really hard on getting ready for clinical trials. And they're finally here. And they might really help our kids with rare diseases. And it's heartbreaking right now to think that these clinical trials might be delayed, that these life-changing treatments for our children might be delayed, but it's gonna still happen. We have to all keep working on it, keep collecting natural history data, keep entering data into the registries that you have, keep in contact with your care providers and your support groups and your teams of investigators, keep the ball moving forward. When COVID-19 dies down, we can all jump right back into this again.